Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Rachel, for uh, shepherding us through this. And um, welcome, everyone. And, and thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon for growing open education programs through a social justice lens. Um, I know that uh, you'll we'll all learn a lot here today from these amazing folks. Um, so without further ado, I wanna go ahead and do introductions and then we'll get into the panel. So I'm Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER at Open Education Global. And I, I am your moderator today. And we have four amazing open education leaders here. They're not only leaders on their campus and they all are, have unique roles uh, from each other, but they're also leaders within the open education community more broadly. So you're gonna learn a lot today, and I will as well. All right, we will start with, with Beatrice. Hi, I'm Beatrice Canales. I am an, a San Antonio College academic staff and open advocate slash practitioner in San Antonio, Texas. I am committed to being a unicorn in this field and uh, San Antonio College is one of the five colleges in the Alamo Community College District. Thank you so much, Beatrice. All right, Olivia. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Olivia Chang. I'm a professor at Manchester Community College here in Manchester, Connecticut, in one of my classrooms right now. Um, I teach art history, um, and I'm also the project director of an NEH funded grant um, called Not Your Grandfather's Art History. It's a collaboration with Smart History. Some of you may know Smart History is a platform of the Khan Academy. Um, and so I have the honor of working with um, 23 different authors um, from across the country, actually globally um, on that project. So looking forward to sharing that with, with all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Olivia. Kate, you're up next. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kate Cameron. I am the digital services librarian at Kirkwood Community College, which is uh, our main campus is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, I've been supporting faculty adoption of OER here for about 10 years when I first took the CCC OER training. A uh, long time ago. Um, just to give you a little background, Kirkwood has around 17,000 students, um, and we're the second largest community college in Iowa. Um, and as far as OER adoptions, just to give you a brief kind of overview of where we are, um, we've had basically pretty good support of OER. It's been kind of um, the tortoise rather than the hare, I guess, with uh, kind of incremental um, adoptions over time, which is great. They kind of build on each other. Um, and I was really surprised to learn um, when there was a statewide OER survey that Kirkwood actually had the most OER adoptions of uh, any college in Iowa. Um, so that was, that was pretty awesome. And I'm looking forward to talking with everybody here today. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Not, I'm not surprised. I've known Kate for a decade, too. I'm not surprised they're number one in Iowa. All right. Last but certainly not least, Joyce Shumate. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joyce Shumate. I'm the Director of Online Education at College of the Canyons. We're located in Southern California, um, just north of Los Angeles. Um, and in, at our college in our district, um, all of our OER work sort of lives under the online education department. So I oversee a small team of current and former students who work with our instructors to help um, them uh, integrate and also create uh, OER on our campus. And uh, in addition to, to that work, um, I'm grateful to serve on the executive council of CCC OER. 
um, and have had a whole lot of fun um, on another project, the Open for Anti-Racism project, which um, I'll speak more about uh, in this session, but um, I'm really excited about that project because it's exploring how uh, open education can be leveraged to make our teaching and learning anti-racist. So really thrilled to be here um, with all of you and with this incredible panel. Thank you, Joy. And I, I have the pleasure of working with Joy on a number of um, projects. <laughs> so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Community College Consortium for OER, we're a community of practice supporting and encouraging colleges in collaborative development of open educational programs to ensure equitable and inclusive access and success. And these are really um, goals from 15 years ago when we were founded. It looks a little different these days. You know, uh, things have changed in the last 15 years, but we have always been all about um, equitable and inclusive access. And um, we are thrilled to have members across the country and in Canada as well. But just to briefly, since this is a session on social justice, I did want to mention that CCCOER has a strategic plan. Um, pillar number one, which is on equitable learning, speaks directly to social justice. Um, I'm not going to read this to you, but it's about including diverse learners and educators who've been underrepresented. Um, and more broadly, bringing voices into the classroom, um, into the educational materials of those who've been underrepresented and traditionally marginalized. So, for, so um, just a little bit about some of the activities that we plan. We have monthly webinars. We have a group of folks on our exec council that do the planning around that based on surveys with our membership. Um, and those webinars are open to all. Um, if you join our community email, there's a, um, a link there at the top of the page, uh, cccoer.org community dash email. You can join our email list and you'll get a notification of those events that are coming up and, and we welcome we welcome all interested educators. Uh, there's case studies uh, available on our website as well, not only from colleges who are um, in, um, engaged in OER work, but also from students. And we also welcome um, guest blogs. Um, we also have an equity book club that uh, has uh, run for two summers in a row, uh, run by our equity committee. Um, Joy mentioned the Open for Anti-Racism program. We're um, happy to co-lead that with College of the Canyons in the California Community College system. We also have a project called Regional Leaders for Open Education, which is run by Dr. Karen Cangelosi, and she just had a presentation, she and her team, uh, earlier today. So today's topic. Um, Community colleges were the hardest hit sector of public higher education during the pandemic. And the pandemic really exposed existing but worsening inequities in healthcare, housing, and schooling. Um, and we know students' lives were very disrupted, but many colleges made efforts to keep their students um, engaged and um, enrolled at school. And uh, OER was often one of the tools, OER and open pedagogy, to keep their students um, um, progressing on their academic plans. So I, it's so exciting to have um, panelists here um, from across the country. As you know, we've got, um, we've got California, we've got Connecticut, we've got Texas, and we've got Iowa. And each, and each of these um, panelists have unique um, <clears throat> roles that they play. So I think there's something for everyone here. So we're hoping that what you'll learn, you might be able to apply at your college, depending on what your role is. And um, you'll have an opportunity also to ask questions of these panelists um, at the end. But in the meanwhile, please do um, post comments or questions in the chat as we go along. Um, we'd love to answer those um, either if we can in the chat or at the end. All right. So here are the panel questions that we're going to um, we're going to start out with before we um, open it up to the audience. Um, so our first one is tell us a little bit about the open education at your college and also your your own. But how did that pan? How did the pandemic change your open education focus? So a little bit about you know the journey and and then the changes over the last couple of years. Um, and then our second question is, how does your campus center students and faculty from traditionally marginalized communities through your open education programs? And finally, 
um, what supports do you need to sustain and grow the open education programs um, focus on social justice? All right, I am going to stop sharing now if that is okay with folks and um, so that you can see our panelists a, a little bit up closer. And um, so I'm gonna start first with uh, Beatrice. And so tell us a little bit about your, your journey, um, both yours and at your college, Beatrice, and how did the pandemic change that? Well, uh, starting with uh, the fall of 2020, I wanted to learn more about OER. I saw that there was information at our college and I, even though I went through um, Masters of Library Science in 2019, I didn't really hear from my program about open education, it was very little. And so I took uh, the Texas Learns OER through Digitex. Uh, and I know it's uh, growing and it's also, I think Oklahoma has a, a version of it. and. And I discovered a whole field that I knew very little of. And I attended my first open education conference, which I never heard of. And it was online and I received a scholarship. And um, that led me to feel that I needed more education and experiences. So, uh, you know, I received, uh, my background is now, you know, the Creative Commons licensing, yay, Creative Commons, uh, which led me to feeling that I needed more uh, leadership experience. And that led me to spark the open education leadership program. But, um, but prior to the pandemic, uh, Senatory College's OER work was um, entrusted by a task force of faculty, librarians, and college administration. Since we were the first community college in Texas to win the prestigious 2021 Aspen Prize, our group knew that we needed to grow more education programs with a social justice lens. This past spring, the task force included a student representative and graduating student, Victoria Villos from SGA. This practice to include um, student voices as, share, as shared governance is when my colleague, Glory Coleman said that our team should transition from open education awareness to open education action. Victor, um, so Victoria's goals um, included co-creating a campus-wide survey because she felt that students from SAC uh, with the data showing that the majority are female Hispanics attending SAC part-time had enough intersectionalities that needed to be fully representative through survey gathering. My experiences outside of SAC and inside of SAC with students is uh, the heart of social justice. I feel like I ended here, but that's that's how I understood the, the question. Yeah, that's that's wonderful to hear. Um, and it's it sounds like over the last few years, as San Antonio has been also going through the pandemic, along with all of the rest of us, that students have gotten more involved and they're gathering information now, which I think can be very valuable in terms of sharing that with your administrators um, when they hear directly from the students. That's wonderful to hear. All right. Um, and and <laughs> thank you for that question, Elena. I'm going to have to ask Beatrice to, to um, see if she can look that link up for you. Um, I'll screw up the screen if I do that. <laughs> and next up, oh, Olivia, um, and would you like me to ask the question again, or are you, you all, you're all okay? I think I'm good. Thanks, Una. Yeah, I jotted down some, um, some of the key points there. Um, just quick question. Any... Um, any people here who teach art history or who use art often in their classes, humanities, history? Okay, cool. Um, so personally, so I have always taught art history. I've been very lucky that I got my professional start in the community college system. 
uh, right out of grad school. And it's it really been, you know, it really speaks to, I think, um, you know, what I love about teaching is introducing students, you know, to really this whole world um, of history. And so it's been about 10, 11 years now. And in that journey, you know, I started fresh out of grad school, told, okay, you got to teach the survey courses, right? So when you're in grad school, you get very specific and, you know, you're diet, drilling down to these really nitty gritty um, details. And then you're told to teach the survey class, which is really everything from prehistory to, you know, the modern period. And so I, my first thing I did was turn to a textbook, right? The textbook I had <laughs> been taught with in undergrad. Um, and that worked for a while. And then I just got to the point where I couldn't teach that way anymore. One, my students had expressed um, that textbook textbooks were unaffordable for them. Um, many of our students are housing insecure, food insecure. So to buy an art history textbook or even to rent one was um, just not feasible. And um, and the lack of representation was also a key issue of why I moved away from using a text. Um, so actually I applied for a sabbatical, uh, one semester sabbatical and my college uh, supported it, which was great. And it gave me that time and that space to explore what might be out there in terms of OERs for art history um, and to really evaluate the best ones um, and potentially to create one. Um, and so that was sort of beginning of the journey and that actually coincided with the pandemic. So all of this kind of came to a head. Um, and I, I, so I did my research and I found that Smart History was a great resource. Um, it's designed for um, early college students, first, second year students, introductory learners. Um, it had videos, it had short articles, it had webinars, it had just a whole variety of, of media. Um, and so my idea started to generate of um, collecting or creating a, a collection of essays that were authored by BIPOC scholars or scholars who identify as BIPOC um, so that not only were we making this material accessible, um, but we were also diversifying the voices um, that were being included in the interpretation of objects and the narratives and the histories and the objects themselves, right? Art history is a very uh, traditionally Eurocentric um, field of study. Um, and so part of it, it's just been a very organic process. Um, one of the things I realized too is that I wanted equitable pay to be a part of this project. I didn't wanna ask scholars to just contribute their time and energy and expertise for free. I didn't want this to be a voluntary thing. And I feel like also that's something that, you know, uh, communities of color have been asked to do, you know, without being properly compensated. So I applied for an NEH grant that uh, was, was a specifically community college um, fund. And so again, my college was really supportive of that, which I'm very grateful for. And so we're able to compensate our authors um, for their essays to this project. Um, and in terms of the pandemic, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's just exacerbated or, or shown us even to a greater degree, you know, how access is so important, you know, um, many of my students, you know, they do their work on their phone, right? So uh, <laughs> they don't necessarily have their own laptops, their own computers. So you, you need to be just mindful of that and the types of materials you choose, right? Are they compatible with devices, you know, that aren't computers, let's say. Um, and so I can't say that the, the pandemic sort of changed anything I was doing, but I think it just like really threw it into a uh, starker contrast of like how how pressing it is that to, to keep doing the work that we're doing um, and that the whole culture of higher education is changed and is changing. Um, and that, you know, the, maybe how we were taught when we were in college is not, um, is, is perhaps not the best way to go forward. So I think those are just sort of my final thoughts on things. Um, and thanks Beatrice for your background as well. So I'll pass it off back to Uma.
Una, you're muted. I'm sorry. The, uh, the lawn blower came <laughs> in the middle of that. I didn't want everyone to hear that. So Kate, uh, yes, tell us a little bit about your journey and how the pandemic changed things at Kirkwood. Sure. Um, so I guess I kind of jumped ahead in my introduction. I talked a little bit about uh, history of OER at Kirkwood. Um, as far as um, the pandemic, I, I really, I was very curious right away because I was hearing, we were fielding a lot of questions that first uh, spring 2020 semester, um, once everyone was home in March, um, lots of questions about like fair use and copying and scanning things and uploading them to the LMS and all those kinds of questions. And of course, I, I took the opportunity to say, you know, there are these you know, things called OER and there's open licensing and, you know, took that opportunity to, to um, I think, let, you know, more faculty know that that was an option and that they didn't have to, <laughs> I always tell faculty, you know, it's so much easier if you just find the open license stuff. We don't even have to look at this, you know, fair use. Um, but it took until then I noticed, yeah, almost right as soon as the semester was over uh, in spring, over that summer and into the fall, uh, I just got so many people who wanted to learn about OER. And um, I did a, um, just in our um, course management system, I did a little, um, you know, professional development course for faculty. And yeah, I had by far the most participation there of, of any time I've done it that summer of uh, 2020. Um, and we did see, you know, more, uh, more adoptions, def you know, more questions. Um, um, like I said, it always seems to just kind of be the slow and steady here, but it def definitely, um, you know, see that pattern of once one faculty in one department adopts, then I get, you know, over the next semesters, you know, more faculty from that same department or teaching that same course um, also get interested um, and kind of see, um, you know, that modeling of, you know, I, you can really do it and, and this is what it might look like and, um, you know, seeing faculty too and talking to them about how they're always, you know, they're constantly kind of updating materials and kind of adding things and leaving other things out and again just how um, how much OER you know fits so nicely into that um, kind of what they're already doing um, and um, yeah as far as pandemic change I think I, I just um, again it, it was sort of like it all of a sudden made sense for a lot of faculty, like, oh, I can see now why, why, you know, why, why OER, it really kind of clicked for them and they could see their students struggling. I mean, we had so many students that um, um, we were checking out lots of laptops, but also had to hurry up and try to find funding for hotspots. Just so, so many students, I see everybody nodding, yes. Um, that did not, that depended on being able to come to campus to get their internet access. So um, that was a big push as well. That was, gosh, that was probably the biggest, you know, difference that 2020 um, was just, okay, we have these materials that are open. Students can do what they need to with them. They can print them, download them, whatever they need to do. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how it went for us. That's wonderful, and I, I've certainly you know in doing our surveys across our membership, we have heard that too. That interest has grown. Twenty twenty was a little crazy, but after that, I think it really sunk in that uh, that it was a digital era <laughs> for those who had been kind of waiting to go digital. They unfortunately, or fortunately, <laughs> depending on your perspective, were forced to go digital, and they were like, oh. Oh, I guess I, I can do this. And yes. Joy, <laughs> and Joy is going to tell us about that because she's the online education director and she took her faculty through that. <laughs> yes. Um, well, yeah, I'm 
happy to share a little bit about kind of where our college was prior to the pandemic and um, what has shifted as a result of the pandemic. Um, I've got to preface that I'm I'm very fortunate. I've been at College of the Canyons for a little over six years now. Um, and you know, prior to my arriving at, at the college, um, we, and this is thanks to the leadership of um, my dean, James Glopper Grossglag, um, really our, our campus had already pretty well established OER in terms of um, in understanding, first of all, what OER even is and, and embracing it as a, you know, a viable tool and resource to use for teaching and learning. Um, but of course, you know, it, it was entirely optional for instructors to choose to use, but our model on our campus prior to the pandemic, um, we spent a lot of time and really probably in the last five or six years, spent a lot of time um, developing a team of current and former uh, College of the Canyon students to be that support system for instructors. Um, our focus on our campus was really like OER creation. Um, we didn't place as much emphasis on adoption, but really on creation. So the idea was that our team of current and former students um, could assist uh, and support our, our faculty with, you know, all things OER um, that maybe was a bit outside of their wheelhouse. So we really wanted to be able to leave it to our instructors to be um, the content experts and then have a team that could offer the support, like searching, formatting, you know, accessibility. Um, and, you know, as, as Olivia said, that this, it requires a lot of work that also requires um, and should be honored with compensation. And uh, in addition to compensating our instructors, we also just wanted to try to take as much of a load off of them um, by really trying to provide as much wraparound support with um, OER and really kind of like open textbook creation. Um, and, you know, also our, our focus kind of pre-pandemic was really um, a, a, a big focus on cost savings. So a lot of the, um, as we would try to uh, engage with faculty and encourage them to consider adopting OER, the, the pitch was always um, very much focused on cost and saving students, um, you know, reducing textbook costs. I would say after the pandemic and as we were moving through and having to adjust through the pandemic, um, obviously all of us were teaching and learning online or some version of that. And um, that in and of itself was a huge challenge and a huge lift, um, you know, providing that professional development support for our instructors so that they felt prepared and able to deliver quality instruction. Um, but it also caused us as, as a campus and um, you know, me as a, as a leader on my campus overseeing OER to really consider what is it that, how can OER actually support our students um, and how can this be a resource for our instructors who are making this incredible shift online through the pandemic? Um, so we kind of shifted our focus as it related to OER to really encourage more adoption um, so as to lighten the load for our instructors. They were already, you know, making this huge shift to online and um, so we didn't want to ask one more thing of them like, oh, yes, and write a textbook while you're at it, even though that had been our model and we still maintained our team. Um, but that's a lot to ask um, when, you know, I know all of you were, were going through such an incredible transition. So we really shifted our focus towards adoption, um, but also recognizing some of the maybe existing limitations of OER, but the opportunities that OER created to um, build and create culturally responsive materials. So it was an opportunity for us to sort of shift our pitch to our instructors about this is an opportunity um, for us to work in partnership to, you know, adopt and adapt um, existing materials, but also you can contribute your expertise while elevating the contributions of others in the field, you know, BIPOC um, contributors to the field, um, which was really important. So, you know, that shift towards adoption also was a shift towards us 
not only um, making the pitch about cost, but making the pitch about how this is an opportunity for our students to see themselves in their learning. This is an opportunity for our students to also have, you know, provide better access to the learning materials. Um, but also in my role on campus, I am an administrator. So, you know, we're all kind of dealing with the challenges of declines in enrollment. And um, it enabled us to help make the pitch for OER being utilized or leveraged as um, an enrollment management strategy. So we look very heavily to, and we work in close partnership with our institutional research team on campus um, because data, data will make the case when we're trying to find funding, you know, and, um, you know, again, back to Olivia saying, you know, we have to be able to pay our, our instructors for this incredible work that they're putting in. So to make the case, you know, turning to data has been something that we have re really relied heavily on because the data supports that OER helps our students. Um, so we look at everything from success and retention rates, which locally on our campus, we have the local data to show that students are succeeding at a higher rate in courses that are using OER. We have the data from our institutional research team to show that we're retaining students in OER classes. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of enrollment, um, you know, we have, we look at fill rates. So the, those are the rate at which courses um, reach full capacity. And we have the data over time to show that you know, courses that are scheduled um, that appear as OER or zero textbook cost in the schedule of classes, those fill and those outpace the, the fill rates of classes that don't use OER. So, you know, it's, it's kind of trying to um, uh, meet the needs, like show how OER can meet the needs of our campus community um, and, and being able to kind of shift the conversation based on who you're talking to or who you're maybe reaching out to for resources. So um, building those connections with instructors and appealing appealing to them in, in a way that's meaningful to them in terms of, you know, the opportunity to include students and help your students succeed, um, but also being able to, you know, have a strong um, argument or a strong case maybe when, you know, trying to convince other administrators like, yes, we need to keep funding these projects. Um, so the pandemic has very much shifted our focus, but I, I would say um, sort of the silver lining out of it is I think we've shifted in a positive way that is proving to be more helpful um, for our students. Thank you, Joy. Um, data is important. Um, I want to circle back around to Beatrice because I don't think she shared her very special project that um, she led at um, through her Spark Leadership Program and um, she's implementing on her campus. Um, yes, uh, so in my Spark Open Education Leadership Fellowship, I focused on international and or dual citizenship students. Uh, there are also unicorns on our campus, and I felt that they would have a unique point of view on how to create content with a bilingual and or bicultural lens. Uh, I paired um, a work, for instance, I paired a work study student, um, Allison, uh, with a, a faculty member that uh, adopted the student's renewable assignment uh, resource because through their collaboration, they um, produced a wonderful resource that will increase um, more uh, diverse student voices every semester. Uh, Allison had um, a dual citizenship in Mexico and the US, but she had to pay out of pocket for her classes. So back to um, compensation, uh, I wanted to um, be able to offer Allison a way for her to find meaning and um, have something for her to receive at the end of her work with us. So um, not only did she add uh, her openly licensed resource linked to her resume and portfolio, she also received experiential credit uh, through Alamo Colleges um, because through her reflection on uh, San Antonio College's marketable skills rubric and 
uh, her own self-reflection on the whole process. Uh, together, um, Allison and I, um, we agreed that her OER work utilized many of the skills uh, necessary, uh, marketable skills um, ne um, necessary for her to uh, receive this credit on a transcript. So she, um, we agreed that she, she utilized her communication, her critical thinking, social responsibility or global engagement and uh, personal responsibility uh, skills. Uh, the OER and marketable skills work that she did, um, that Allison did, um, she was able to view her work, her lens to exist um, after she graduated. And uh, through this work, I, I wanted to make sure that uh, open pedagogy is around uh, on our campus. And uh, this was uh, something that I knew that if we um, as a college would tap into our students to uh, look at their open work as uh, not only for what they can do at the college, but for themselves, for the global community, then I, um, I, I wanted to make sure that she felt engaged and also um, was able to be compensated for her time. And so um, together, I think this was a great uh, um, way for her to enhance her learning. And um, it was a way for the faculty member to adopt uh, a resource that, um, that she had never heard of, which was a renewable assignment. And uh, she was able to adopt that and add to her curriculum. And she said this will help uh, her, um, the faculty member was able to look at her curriculum in a different way and, um, and to add um, more meaning for students who uh, would take her courses. Thank you, Beatrice. And that, that's a wonderful example of open pedagogy and uh, service learning. Uh, intersecting along with aligning with, um, you know, learning outcomes for your college around marketable skills, because that's all of us are trying to do that at our colleges is to help students develop marketable skills so that they can go out in the workplace um, as they complete their degrees and really take all that forward. So that's very encouraging. Um, I'm doing a little check on the time. Um, I have like, we have kind of like one question left and I'm gonna give it as kind of an option if you wanna answer it. And um, then we will move to audience, uh, to the audience uh, participation. I know we have at least one or two questions in there that have been, that have been uh, posted. Um, so all of you are focusing on social justice in some aspect at your college through the lens of open education, OER, open pedagogy, open educational practices. What supports do you need to sustain and grow that work? Because, you know, a number of you um, had mentioned when we did our little rehearsal that you'd used HERF funds. So you'd use some of the pandemic recovery funds uh, to, um, to, to up your OER efforts during the pandemic, but those of course will go away um, if they haven't already, um, if you haven't already spent those. And so what, what do you need? And I, I know that funding is always the top one, but if you can be a little more nuanced about it, <laughs> besides funding, what other kind of supports do you need um, at your campus? And I'm um, just, you can raise your hand or you can just speak up um, panelists, um, whichever, whoever would like to go first. I'm happy to go for it. <laughs> um, well, yes, Una, as you mentioned, of course, um, you know, time, energy, and money, we can never have enough of those things to support th this effort. Um, I, I think that'll be on the top of most of our lists for forever moving forward. Um, but beyond beyond that, um, I, I would say, you know, some professional development training has proven um, very, important um, and really essential, especially as 
we embrace um, approaching OER and open pedagogy with a particularly with a culturally responsive lens. So offering our um, our, our faculty that that professional development support, um, and then also sort of following the model that we've developed locally on campus, uh, ensuring that we're able to continue um, providing support to a team who can then offer the the support to our instructors. Um, but also, you know, I, I would add that partnerships on campus are um, incredibly valuable to sustain the OER efforts or open efforts on your campus, um, and and also to to in, uh, to grow and enhance those efforts. Uh, as they relate to in ensuring that we're approaching this work um, equitably and to meet the needs of our students. Um, so some ways that we do that on, on campus is partnering, partnering with our academic senate and our associated student government. Um, when you have buy-in from, from those groups, that alone for us has been really instrumental and helpful. Um, and, you know, I, I go back to what Kate mentioned, like that helps us sort of open the door to have a conversation for maybe one instructor to consider um, adopting OER or, or even creating their own. And then that opens the door even wider to maybe an entire department or a, a group of instructors who teach the same course, um, kind of embracing that resource and then recognizing their opportunities to um, perhaps uh, adopt or create even more. Um, but also, you know, partnerships, a lot of, um, I, I would imagine a lot of your campuses are really engaged in you know, equity work or, you know, whatever terminology um, that you're using on your campus and, you know, inclusion work, um, but partnering with those groups on campus can be really valuable because, you know, again, it's, um, our approach is less about, you know, teaching to the textbook, but rather open being a tool that can be leveraged um, for teaching and learning. So partnering with those groups on campus who are having these conversations so that OER or your open work doesn't just exist in a silo, but rather um, is viewed as a tool and an opportunity um, in those equity conversations or in those enrollment strategy and enrollment management meetings. Um, you know, uh, folks on our campus might be a little bit tired of hearing me, but trying to trying to have a seat at the table by showing up and saying like, hey, uh, OER and open pedagogy is, is a tool for this thing you're trying to accomplish here on campus. So instead of it kind of living in its own little silo, um, you know, for, for me and for us on our campus, really uh, trying to leverage open as a tool to help our campus meet um, a variety of, of needs. And I, that's, that's so important. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, those partnerships are really key. And I think I saw Olivia first. So I'll, I'll go to Olivia. Yeah, and I just wanted to echo exactly what Joy was saying and just say that, um, you know, it, it can be an intimidating prospect, I think, to, you know, to shift away from a text or the way you've been teaching for so long and to embrace something new and, you know, maybe entirely digital. Um, and I think that is really key is like building the sense of community, whether it's at your campus or across campuses within your discipline, that um, I think it's also really important to like give instructors the sense of, you know, um, this allows them flexibility and freedom, but they're also part of a larger conversation like you said, Joy, and that, you know, there's support beyond just like, here's, you know, here are these materials, like go forth with them, you know, that you can, as an instructor, you know, learn through this process and that it takes time to adjust and figure out what works best for you. Um, and that, you know, you're not the only one making this transition and then maybe you can learn from others and their experience. So yeah, I think, you know, when we go into teach, sometimes we are very much in like our own little silos. And so I think it's really valuable to, um, seek out a community if there's not one established already, uh, or just, you know, know that, um, yeah, there are others, you know, out there and to join a community if you can, or to, to see if you can build one um, of, of people, you know, experiencing the same thing. And Beatrice, go ahead, sorry. No, well, just real quick, um, I put down data mining for how 
faculty utilize open pedagogy because at Alamo colleges we have a OER attribute for all of our um, OER and inclusive access attributes and so we can um, easily find um, who you know which courses are utilizing OER but we're not capturing those faculty that uses open pedagogy um, but do not have a full course um, revolving around it. So I, I, I believe that, you know, going forward, you know, that data that includes um, faculty who um, utilizes some part of open in their classrooms should also be celebrated. You know, um, at, at SEC, we're going to have a student um, uh, vote on the best OER that is uh, submitted by faculty. So we have faculty who are submitted the, um, the best OER sites and um, and students are voting on what they consider as the best of all the faculty. So it's really SAC trying to find ways to uh, find the faculty who are using open pedagogy but are not putting down on that attribute that they're an o OER course. And it's students um, using uh, their right to vote and find uh, the best, um, how they see as the best resource for their own learning and education at SEC. Wonderful. I mean, that, that, that'll that help create awareness, I think, um, around um, OER, uh, having the students vote. I mean, both ways, right? <laughs> Faculty will be competing a little bit <laughs> and students will be, will be voting. So wonderful idea. Um, well, I think at this point, um, Kate, would you, did you, did you, you, you're okay? Um, yeah, okay. So I think at this point, we will go to questions from um, the audience. We did have one way back, I think, uh, and maybe Rachel, Rachel might have caught some that I didn't as well. We had one way back about um, using your phone. Uh, so uh, rather having uh, developed, making sure that OER is compatible with uh, students' phones, since we know that uh, for the majority of students these days, the phone is the first thing that they use. Um, and I, I don't know if one of our panelists would like to speak to that. Uh. Did, Beatrice, did you want to speak to the phone or you just, so no, no worries, you just still have your hand up. Um, would, would somebody like to speak to that one? Um, I don't really, I haven't run into it much, the question. Um, we uh, recently subscribed to Pressbooks and that's, I think, one of the benefits of, you know, having a platform that has all those, I mean, there's so many file types that you can um, convert to, um, you know, with one, ed with just the one editing platform, um, right. not to press, you know, press books in particular, but just as an example of, of that flexibility. But yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I know that that's something very desirable. Um, um, so <laughs> thank you for whoever posted that. I don't know, Joy, if you have any experience with that, um, with your OER team. I know you test for accessibility. I don't know if you test on the phone at this point um, to make sure that, is that? Yeah, we don't, um, I mean, we just format our, our text for accessibility more broadly. So. I haven't actually, it's a great question, but it hasn't really come across um, sort of my, my desk, if you will. Like it, has, it hasn't been something that instructors have expressed is a, a challenge. I think, um, you know, just I think more broadly, the, the access in, in general is, is a challenge for students. I think Olivia mentioned, you know, many students just not having access to even a laptop or a desktop in the first place. Um, so, on the whole, you know, we've just seen that when we're designing, and part of that is the course design, you know, online course design for the mobile experience. So um, also shifting an emphasis towards that. But um, as it relates to OER, we haven't heard a lot of feedback, positive or negative, as it relates to a mobile experience. But um, I would say in that case, um, the access in and of itself has, has been a, a 
significant uh, help for students. So yeah, none, none of our survey data has has from students has come back to say that it's been problematic. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we had a question from Phoebe, um, which we might want to um, speak to. So regarding professional development, can you speak more about your approaches? I heard in recent session about folks moving forward toward one-on-one -on -one support versus creating a Canvas course, for example. So this is probably to uh, Joy and Kate, who, who do uh, a lot of professional development in their capacity. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Beatrice and um, Olivia, if you do as well, please please feel free to address that question. It looks like Joy put a really good or, uh, response there in the chat. Um, yeah, I missed it. I, I'll just jump in with kind of my approach is just, it, I sort of approach it with what I learned about being a librarian, which is you have to be available when somebody has the question and has the need. Um, you also have to talk about yourself all the time. Um, you know, if there's a professional development opportunity, you know, offer something, even if it's not the best venue for maybe getting people started, it gets the information out there and lets people kind of see, oh, I'm not the only one interested and maybe I can work with my colleague over here and um, kind of building that. Um, I haven't had great luck with online workshops. I mentioned I offered one in 2020 that went pretty well. Um, but people tend to need uh, that one-on-one -on -one help. Um, and then the other aspect of that is just um, knowing the other people in your college who can provide support. Um, for example, sometimes we, the person finds, faculty finds the OER, but they really have some technical issues or they're trying to integrate it with their assignments. I say, you know, why don't you talk to Mike? Uh, he's an instructional designer. He's going to be all over that, you know. So. Um, kind of being able to, you know, work together in that way and pass the ball around without worrying you're dumping somebody here. Yeah. Uh, right. Your colleague, yeah. Instructional <laughs> de designers rock. We didn't, we, we oh, didn't yeah. get one today, but um, yeah. on the panel, but um, they definitely do. Uh, wonderful. Yes. And I, 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 I Joy's, Joy's comments and were, were quite appropriate that, um, and I think a combination with Kate's is that you need to be there to answer the question. But for some faculty, they really do want to work asynchronously, and it's certainly not all. They might need you to answer a couple questions live, but then they can go off and work asynchronously. So I, I definitely think uh, you've got to look at, <laughs> God forbid, I should say, learning styles of your faculty, you know, and offer a variety. Um, were there any other questions we missed um, that that I, that I missed? I know we're, we're at, uh, we got two minutes to go, right, Rachel? <laughs> yes, and I did see one question in the chat about um, OER materials being um, provided in for-profit kind of platforms. So um, I don't know if you would like to address that or not, but I did see that mentioned in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I did see that one too. I mean, open licensing, um, that's, um, that's a possibility. So stewardship is a really important um, consideration for the open ed community. Um, I um, mentioned the CARE framework, and thank you, Judith Sebesta, our uh, CCCOER Exec Council President, uh, who works at ISME. She posted the CARE framework, which talks about that. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else has something more um, that they can add on that. Um, it, I think it it is unfortunate that some of the people who contributed to the Lumen Learning courses didn't expect them to turn up there on Course Hero. <laughs> it was quite a discussion on our email list about that um, six months ago, I think. Yeah. Well, I want to thank these panelists. Um, you know, once again, I learned more today. Uh, from them. And um, I thank our audience for joining us. Um, I think we can hang around a little bit uh, after Rachel turns off the recorder. Um, if you've got some individual questions, and I, I can stay here for another 10 minutes. I'm, I'm not sure if my panelists can. Some of them teach and have other responsibilities. But thank you again.